more second. All right, we are live. So I will begin. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, everybody who's watching on Facebook. Uh, my name is Carolyn Gillespie. I'm with the Mississippi Humanities Council, and this is um, Ideas on Tap Virtual Edition. Um, Ideas on Tap, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, is a happy hour discussion program uh, from the Mississippi Humanities Council, where each month we tackle um, important, relevant topics um, and hear from a variety of voices and, um, and viewpoints on the issue. Um, so I want to say tonight, thank you to our panelists who are here uh, joining me from their homes and their offices. Um, this is a little bit of a different look than we're used to for Ideas on Tap. You know, normally we would be all together um, in a bar or a restaurant. So I've got my drink here with me um, and I'm, you know, at the Humanities Council office, but uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, I want to thank you for participating tonight. Um, and I will introduce our panelists in just a second, but I will say um, before I do that uh, the, the viewpoints expressed tonight uh, by our panelists are not necessarily those of the Humanities Council, um, but, but thank you for joining us um, and for sharing your views. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Um, if you are joining us for the first time or missed out on a lot of previous Ideas on Tap programs, um, you can find them all on on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page. Um, so if you're interested in going back and seeing some of our past ones, you can go check out all of the recordings there. Um, and you know, tonight, since we can't all be in the same room, we still wanna hear from all of you. So um, please feel free to post your comments and your questions in the, um, in the video page, um, and then we will try to get to them throughout the evening. Um, so with that, I'm gonna quickly um, introduce our panelists um, and I'm gonna go in the, in the way that I see them on the screen. So to my left is Dr. Patrick Hopkins. He is a professor of philosophy and the director of the neuro uh, philosophy major at Millsaps College in Jackson. He's also um, on staff at the University of Mississippi Medical Center Center for, Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Um, so he is here as our really professional philosopher tonight for this topic. Um, to my bottom left, I see Cassandra Welchlin. Um, she is the co-convener of the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable, which is an economic and social justice um, organizing network in Mississippi that focuses on a variety of different policy issue areas. Um, before she started working um, with the Black Women's Roundtable, uh, Cassandra was with the Mississippi Women's Economic Security Initiative um, through uh, the Mississippi Low Income Child Care Initiative. I think that's correct. Um, and Cassandra actually, I went back and looked at our notes. Cassandra served um, on one of our very first Ideas on Taps that we ever did, and it was almost four years ago um, next month. So we've come a long way, hopefully, um, but we're glad to have Cassandra back with us. Um, and then uh, directly underneath me is Russ Latino, who is an attorney um, and who serves as Senior Vice President for Empower Mississippi. Uh, and before he started out as on the Board of Directors for Empower um, and then left um, to, to work for the Mississippi Chapter of Americans for Prosperity, which he directed for several years. Um, and then also served as president of the Mississippi chapter of the Federalist Society. Um, and like I said, he's now back as the senior vice president for Empower. So we're very glad to have all of you here tonight. Um, we know that we're gonna hear a lot of different um, viewpoints and opinions. Um, and that is kind of one of our, um, our guiding lights of Ideas on Tap is that we can get people together who maybe disagree on things um, and have different opinions, but um, we can all kind of practice um, the, the civil discourse model uh, through Ideas on Tap. So it's a way for all of us to have a really casual, casual conversation about things that are sometimes not so casual um, in terms of ideology. Um, so, you know, thinking about um, the common good and individual rights um, seems like a very um, kind of abstract topic. Um, 
But then I think it's something that whether or not we all kind of realize is something that we've considered a lot over the last few months. Um, and I think that, that one thing um, that um, has really come out of this is how, you know, the, the mask has become, the face mask has become the symbol of, um, of you know, who you're thinking about and why you're thinking about um, and kind of what your motivations are. And so, you know, that really thinking about why you wear a face mask or why you don't wear a face mask, um, it's not just about the face masks, it says so much more. And so I think that that's really something that kind of started us thinking about this whole conversation. Um, and so I'm going to um, open up by, by asking Patrick to kind of give us the history um, and kind of the, the premise of this struggle um, I'll say struggle uh, between the individual rights and the common good. And um, how did we get to where we are today, um, where wearing a mask or not wearing a mask can become such a political statement? Well, I mean, as you might imagine, there's quite a complex history to a lot of this, but essentially it's important to recognize that the, the very idea of uh, a society has been around for, you know, uh, endless ages, but there has been a question about what counted as the primary unit of society. So at various times, it has been thought that a particular caste or particular class was the fundamental unit of society. It might have been thought that the family was the fundamental unit of society. It might have been thought that a religious hierarchy was the were, were the divisions into which the fundamental units of society were divided. But starting around the um, 1600s, it became uh, much more um, uh, strongly argued that the fundamental unit of society was the individual. In fact, um, some people who were fond of, of arguing this would actually say and a rhetorical flourish, there is no such thing as society. And what they meant by that was, if you were to take away all the individuals, you wouldn't have a society left. So society is simply a way to describe the collection of individuals. And in some ways, this is a fundamental way of looking at the world that's referred to as classical liberalism. Now, the liberalism in that uh, language is not the sort of liberal that we use today. But the idea with classical liberalism is that since the individual was the fundamental unit of society, then the rules of society needed to be uh, centered around what would permit the individual to flourish. And so there were some uh, famous uh, ways of looking uh, at this. One, was the idea that the primary goal of, of, a, of a state or a, uh, the rules of a society was simply to prevent harm to others. So usually it's called the harm principle. So the idea there was that uh, the state was not justified in interfering with individuals' liberty except to prevent them from harming others. So when we think about something along those lines, then the question becomes, well, what counts as harm? Because the devil's always in the details. So uh, one thing that becomes important then in wearing a mask is, is it the case that the function of the mask is primarily to prevent us from harming other people as they go about their daily activities? Or is the function of the mask primarily uh, to encourage us to protect ourselves. Early on in this harm principle discussion, which was um, largely brought up by the famous philosopher John Stuart Mill, um, he was asked, well, what about people who use their liberty? What about these individuals who use their liberty in ways that harm themselves? What if they drink themselves to death? Or what if they um, uh, drive themselves into debt? And his answer to that was essentially, well, of course that will happen and that is a risk, but the problem is that if we use the state to try to get people to uh, protect themselves, almost always the state goes overboard and the state will do something which will end up unintentionally being harmful. So as long as the state can stay out of our way, 
it's still the best policy for people to make their own decisions. So when it comes to the mask, um, it is a, uh, if in order to prevent us from harming others, it would be seen as justified uh, to expect us to wear the mask. But if the, the mask is primarily simply to protect ourselves, then it would usually be seen by this in this view as something that should be left up to the individual. Now, there's a lot more complicated stuff, of course, that, that gets into this. Um, but one other uh, element that is worth talking about is the rise of the concept of a human right. Uh, the concept of a, a natural right has been around a, a long time, but it was typically related to theological convictions or just practical state convictions. But over time, particularly with the um, uh, American Revolution, the French Revolution, this notion of, of being born with a certain type of right, being born with this uh, difficult to define but, but important moral quality, the, the notion of a human right came to be seen as a trump card against the common good. So that the, um, the, the very, the use, the very invocation of a human right was to prevent the state from um, uh, requiring you to do something in order to benefit everyone else. And that has been a very contentious thing uh, for a long time, primarily because we don't have any way to determine what rights we have. Uh, there's no such rights detector. Uh, maybe we could get a grant from the Mississippi Humanities Council to build a rights detector. That would be a useful thing. Um, I don't know how we'd go about doing that. And the list of rights, as you might expect, historically that get listed have gone up and up and up. Every time there's a list of rights that is supposed to uh, prevent the state from interfering with us, it gets longer and more complicated. And it's very difficult to, to you know, determine how, those, uh, how we're supposed to know what those rights are. But so in general, I would say that um, in more modern times, the idea is that the fundamental unit of society is the individual. And as a result, the, uh, the primary point of the state is simply to restrict individuals and their liberty only when it comes to the idea that they may harm someone else. However, there is one thing that has been um, argued by a number of people, and that is that it is actually to the benefit of the common good to have this more minimal state interference program. Uh, famously with philosophers and economists like Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, the idea was that if you allow people to have optimal, not necessarily maximal, but optimal liberty, then they're reasonable enough and they're practical enough that it will work out to everyone's best interest in the long run. Now, some psychological research and some behavioral economics research has uh, cast some doubt on that. It turns out that we may not be quite as rational as um, the optimist of those um, early ways of thinking were. But anyway, that's, that tends to be how it how it's has played out. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Ross or Cassandra, would anybody like to jump in and kind of add anything to that? Yeah, so I, I think uh, Patrick did a very good job of kind of laying out uh, the historical foundations around individual rights, and in some ways um, kind of uh, made subtly the point that I was going to make about the framing of the discussion, which is that uh, the way the discussion is framed suggests that individual rights and common good are in conflict with each other. And I would suggest that in most instances, individual rights and common good are actually aligned with each other. And that there's a, a tremendous amount of common ground, regardless of where you fall on the ideological spectrum, on this point. Most people would say the freedom to assemble is a good thing. Most people would say the freedom to speak is a good thing. Most people would say the freedom of the press is a good thing. Most people would say having agency over yourself, being able to hone your skills and, and use your talents to earn a living and create value for other people in a marketplace are good things, that the protection of property, 
is a positive thing that encourages good stewardship, that encourages economic risk-taking, that leads to economic growth. And there's tremendous empirical evidence to support this. If you look at the countries that are the most prosperous countries in the world, that have the longest life expectancy, that have the greatest literacy rates, they tend to be free countries. And if you look at the countries that don't have those things, they tend to have more command and control in the way that they operate. So, so I would make the case that individual rights and the common good are actually uh, very simpatico. Um, I would say that if the common good is a euphemism, though, for collectivism, then individual rights and collectivism arguably are at odds and often are at odds. Um, but that's not necessarily a good euphemism to treat common good and collectivism as the same thing, um, because there are tremendous examples of collectivism gone awry. Um, if you look at Mao and Pol Pot and Stalin and even you know, less dramatic examples of that. If you look at instances in which the majority has imposed its will on minorities, there are many atrocities that you would point to. And so I would just say that it's important to think of the framing not as being a, a framing of conflict, but a, a framing that often actually aligns where the common good has benefited from the fact that people have these freedoms. I, I think the that's sort of the, the philosophy side of it. And I think Patrick's articulation of what I would call negative rights and positive rights uh, is the way that classical liberals or conservatives today um, think about the dividing line. So a negative right is essentially that to, to be free to think, speak, and act without interference. Um, so it's, it's not at a cost to anyone. A positive right is an articulation of something that would have a cost to another human being. And so if you think about individual rights as those negative rights that don't have a cost other than to not be infringed upon, the right to speak, think, act in accord with your conscience so long as you don't violate someone else's rights, then that's not in conflict with uh, a lot of the conversation that's going on right now around COVID. So you could very easily look at that articulation of what is a classical liberal articulation of individual rights and say that you find on the back end that somebody not wearing a mask, as an example, ultimately is actually acting outside of their individual rights because they're doing something that creates harm or potential harm to another human being. So I, I tend to agree with the way that Patrick laid out the philosophy. I think there are two other considerations though. I think there's a legal consideration that a lot of people have raised. Uh, once upon a time, I was a constitutional lawyer. I'm recovering now. Um, but I would tell you, and I've had this argument with, with my friends who say, well, they're clearly just violating the Constitution left and right with some of the restrictions that they're putting in place. That's just simply not true. Um, there is a historical origin around the police power that predates the United States. Um, that was adopted as a matter of common law that is uh, cemented in our Constitution. Uh, you know, a lot of conservatives would refer to it as the Tenth Amendment that basically gives states the power to regulate those things which are not regulated by the federal government. And that police power throughout Supreme Court precedent since the beginning of time of our country uh, has found that in instances like this, the government has a legitimate police power to protect public safety. And so the, the legal side of this actually goes against the idea that these restrictions on their face are, um, are in some way a violation of a right. Um, now, how the restrictions get applied could potentially violate a right. There are examples dating back to the early 1900s um, when there was the, the Spanish flu of 1918. Uh, the Supreme Court in one case did throw out some restrictions, but it's because those restrictions effectively aimed at people because of their nationality. So it wasn't a reasonable restriction based on a health concern. It was a restriction that targeted a set of people. And you see potentially some viewpoint discrimination type stuff coming out of COVID um, that, could, that could pose interesting legal questions. I, I think the third thing is, though, that even if philosophically a, a restriction is consistent with a classical liberal worldview, that it doesn't really conflict with the notion of individual rights if the, the harm principle or the non-aggression principle that Patrick mentioned is implicated. And even if the law allows for some of this, there's still a question about the, the wisdom of it. Um, and I think 
to me, that's the part of the debate that that really hasn't been had. Uh, and I hope maybe we can have some of the discussion today. For what it's worth, I wear my mask everywhere I go um, because I think it would be selfish not to. There's there's enough medical evidence to me to suggest that it has a mitigation effect. And the burden on me is minimal. But I think other things like shutting down businesses, as an example, is, a, is something that we should really consider the wisdom of that. Um, and I'll say one more thing and, and then be quiet. But if you look at... Um, this idea that the regulations are intended to protect us. And some of them no doubt have that intention. Um, you know, there's an argument that the regulations actually don't protect those people who would naturally be oppressed or don't protect those people that are naturally vulnerable, but they actually protect the privileged. Um, and so if you, for instance, look at the way that business closures occurred during COVID, Walmart stayed open. Target stayed open. All of these big box stores that were deemed essential stayed open. The regulation effectively not only protected them, but it pushed small business customers to them. Um, and so as, as we think about the wisdom of how we address something like COVID, I think it's really important that we, we weigh the risk and we have a really accurate assessment of how the regulations actually impact people. There are some that are gonna make complete sense, and I think there are some that are actually harmful to people. Cassandra? Yeah, <laughs> a very um, meaty discussion. Um, so I entered this discussion, well, before I say that, I just wanted to just make a clarifying point around um, kind of how, where I, um, my, my employment. Um, I, I do lead the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable, and um, and I co-founded the Mississippi Women's Economic Security Initiative, uh, which was a project of the Low Income Child Care Initiative. And that work is still being led under the Black Women's Roundtable. Uh, so I just wanted to put that in there. Thank you. Um, I approached this discussion um, this evening uh, with great pause and with a heaviness. Um, it, it took me a minute to really not wrap my brain around it, but yes, wrap my brain around it and also my heart um, too, and also my people. Um, because we are living in you know, two pandemics for me. Uh, we're living in you know, this healthcare crisis of COVID-19, but we're also living in a racialized um, violence, police brutality um, pandemic as well. Um, and that has touched me and my community in a really profound way. And so, um, so I enter this conversation, um, I come to this as an African-American woman, um, a social worker that's guided by um, a code of ethics, which um, is led by social justice. And also I enter this as an executive director um, leading an organization that centers black women and girls in our black communities. And yet we root our work at the intersections of race, gender and economic justice. And so, um, so I bring all of that to this table um, tonight. And it is heavy, um, quite heavy. And so the struggle for me between individual rights and common good, um, they're not new ideas, um, as these gentlemen um, have said. And they've been a part of a fight in this country since the founding of it. Um, but forever, for me, though, the struggle between this is, I, I kind of redefined it when, I say, when you all say common good and individual rights. I think of it as a struggle between privilege, structural racism, and equity. That's how I look at it, um, given how I entered this and what my experiences have been. So I'll just say that again. It's a struggle for me between privilege, and Russ talked about privilege, and I see his point on that. Then I look at it from privilege in a different way, you know, as well. Um, who in this country really benefits from? Um, the access to. And of course, people of color and Black folks have not. And, um, and then um, 
so privilege, structural racism, and, and equity. And so these two pandemics really, for me, have pulled the sheets off the bed and have really exposed um, even more the inequities and the structural barriers that is rooted in capitalism. Let's be real about that. And, uh, and, and I see that. And, um, and, and I'll get a chance along in this conversation to really talk about how um, that has impacted Black community and Black women um, in this country who, um, and Black women actually bore babies to, to help with capitalism in this country. And so, um, and so I have a very different lens um, here and how we set this up, set this conversation up. Um, so these two, you know, concepts, I kept thinking about, okay, individualism, Charles Darwin, survival of the fittest, and uh, the common good, which brings up to me, you know, this African proverb um, that says, you know, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. And so it, it really does embrace the idea that humans can exist in isolation. And you know, Desmond Tutu, whom I love dearly, wow, he said, my humanity is bound up in yours, but we can only be human together. And he understood that the potential of human beings working collectively to achieve goals is infinitely, infinitely um, greater than the potential of any individual. And so our collectiveness is bound up together. But yet often this, what this country you know, has done um, has, you know, uh, created a, you know, a system in which, again, um, only certain people have, um, have those kind of access to. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the war on poverty programs, who was really able to access that? I mean, you had laws, language written um, that really excluded, you know, a whole population of people, right? So, you know, um, Black folks and domestic workers couldn't get access to some of those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, you're thinking about the redlining of housing and also the business structure. Like, we couldn't get access to that, but white men could definitely get access to that. There's a program that I think of, um, it's, it's the Mother's Pension Program. And this gets to, like, welfare rights right, and who really had access to, um, to these benefits, you know, during the 19, 1910s, when the war was going on, you had, um, you know, um, white mothers whose husbands were going off to the war, and they, and they died, or they were in the war, and those husbands couldn't provide for their families, and so what happened? The government took them on, and gave them a pension so that you wouldn't have uh, parents, uh, children who were going into foster care or um, you have food to put on the table. But now here we are, you know, so many decades later and we have the child care subsidy program. And there's a fight about how much money can go to that. And so you see these inequities that exist that has been a part of this country since the beginning. And so this conversation is, um, it's, it is, it's quite heavy. And, and for me, I am guided again by these codes of ethics that say um, social justice is important and it is a right, right? That everyone, because of who you are being born, you have an eligible rights, right? And so to live a life free of oppression and a life uh, free of um, isolation, and that we are living in a country that is supposed to um, take care of its citizens. And so um, that has not been the case. And Patrick, you know, Patrick talked about the harm principle. And um, what was what, 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 what that triggered for me was. Um, the harm principle is there has been harm that has been happening, you know, in this country um, since the founding of it, particularly, you know, my people um, where, you know, black women, again, 
you know, our, our labor was not valued as, you know, um, but we could get paid for it. And we was just really there to produce uh, for, um, um, you know, the landowners, right? And so this country was really built on cheap labor and built on our backs, you know, where we bore those babies to help with that land. And so, um, so that brings up a lot for me, you know, and having this, this particular conversation. And um, I do want to get into like, who are we, who are we talking about even today when we're living in these, you know, these two pandemics um, and even with the legal and the policing, you know, um, you know, policing um, in this country for black folks um, um, is, it has been detrimental because it was used as a tool, you know, to, um, to intimidate and to, um, yeah, to, 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 to intimidate. And so it has been, um, and so we see right now today where we are, you know, in this country when it comes to policing and who is really being um, harmed the most and it's black bodies and brown bodies. And so that's kind of where I'm landing, you know, in this conversation when we talk about individualism and when we talk about the common good, um, like who, where does privilege lie? Where do the inequities lie, you know, in that? And then um, also structural racism is wrapped into all of it because we do live in a country that's based on structures and principles and policies and laws, but not everyone get the same um, started out on the same footing. So I hope we can begin to break some of that down and have a, have a conversation. I think we're already having it though. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's awesome. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I talk to conservatives about a lot is, you know, we're very quick to talk about the founders in reverent ways. Um, because the ideas articulated in the Declaration of Independence and some of those founding documents are good ideas. The idea that every person is created with inalienable rights, that they have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, but I think we've got to grapple with the fact that, you know, Patrick was talking about Mill or Locke and all of these philosophers that help create sort of the foundation of the way that we think about our government and what's special about our government, that the ideas could have been good, but there was tremendous hypocrisy, right? So part of the thing that I talk to folks about all the time is you can be reverent towards these concepts, but you have to be willing to admit that the concepts were imperfectly applied in massive ways that it created deficits um, with populations that are still disadvantaged because of some of that. Um, and so I don't disagree with you there. I mean, I think, I think all of that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what I, what I look at and see, you know, with the institution of slavery, which is our nation's greatest evil, when I think about that, I don't think that that was the expression of individual rights. I think it was a pretty bald face exploitation and an oppression of, of individual rights. Um, and so I don't see those, those philosophies being at odds. It just was clear during the application um, that there were people who said one thing and did something entirely different and literally denied people individual rights. I, I think the interesting thing that you said about capitalism, and, and this is maybe off topic, but it, it's, it's interesting, um, is that when I see the arguments against capitalism, and there are a lot of them these days, right? is to me what people are arguing against is not really capitalism. Capitalism by definition is you having the freedom to create a product or service and somebody else voluntarily having the freedom to say, I think that product or service will benefit me so I'm willing to pay something for it. And you agree voluntarily on what you pay so that if you create things of value for other people, you benefit from that. That's capitalism. I think what people are really upset about is what they call crony capitalism, but it's not crony capitalism. It's a form of mercantilism. Um, 
It's the idea that the people in power get to make laws and regulations that benefit the people that they are connected to. Um, and we've struggled with mercantilism as a country for a very long time, um, and it still exists today. I mean, you look at the level of corporate welfare that exists today, where you've got $90 billion basically flowing out every year to companies in the form of corporate welfare that don't really need it, where government is picking winners and losers based on who has the most powerful lobbyists. That, to me, is not capitalism. That's a gross perversion of capitalism, and it should end. And so I actually think that the the terminology matters, but but that there's common ground to be found um, through this kind of exploration. I'm going to jump in really quick. Um, I really appreciate um, both Russ and Cassandra touching on this a little bit, but this whole idea of um, privilege and equity. Um, so it seems like you know the the traditional libertarian kind of the the focus on individualism model that we that we see um, tends to favor those with existing privilege or access. Um, so how does or how can equity fit into this model, um, which I think gets to to Cassandra's point, and also a little bit connected to this. I mean, is is the idea of individual freedom um, a racialized um, idea? Um, is it connected to to race because um, freedom wasn't always available for for black people in Mississippi, uh, particularly? Um, so, Cassandra or Russ or Patrick, whoever wants to jump in and kind of share their thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I'll address the, the libertarian angle. Um, I don't consider myself a libertarian. I consider myself a conservative or a classical liberal, and I think they're relatively close um, at this point in time. I mean, sometimes when you say classical liberal, people kind of don't understand what you're driving at. Um, but, but I don't necessarily, well, I, I just don't think that's true, that, that libertarianism uh, is, is a privileged thought process. I mean, the idea that every individual should be treated with dignity, should have rights, government should protect those rights, that's the role of government. If it's done in a, in a just way, then that represents opportunity for everyone. Now, I recognize that there are different kinds of privilege in the world. Um, but what I would say from the vantage point of somebody that's worked with a lot of conservatives and a lot of libertarians, is that the vast majority of them aren't people of substantial means, or they didn't come from, from places of substantial means. Um, you know, I, I can speak to it myself. Uh, I developed this philosophy because I started reading a lot of Hayek when I was in college. But, you know, before that, um, I grew up in a family where there was one person that ever went to college in the entire extended family. I was born in a charity hospital. Uh, I've got cerebral palsy in the left side of my body because of it. And, and you know, I, I didn't develop this thought process because I thought, hey, I want to hang on to what I've got. Um, I believe that there's a lot of historical evidence that the way that wealth and prosperity and well-being is created uh, is through the protection of individual rights. And so what I would suspect is that every person, whether it's Patrick or Cassandra, uh, you know, or anybody listening, what we want are good outcomes. We want people to flourish. Uh, we want people to have opportunity. And so the real question is, is there a system that makes it more likely than not that people have opportunity? And I would argue that, yes, there is tremendous instances of oppression in our country. There is institutional racism in our country. It continues to have a negative effect. There's, there's no doubt about any of that. But by the same token, I would look at our country and say, we're one of the most prosperous countries in the world. We have the longest life expectancy or one of the li longest life expectancies in the world. We have some of the highest literacy rates. We have some of the highest incomes. You know, we, we've got technology across the board that people couldn't have dreamed of 20 years ago. And a lot of that is a byproduct of a system that allows for innovation, that allows for people to seize opportunity using their individual rights to create value for other people. And so I think, I think our existence is far from perfect and there's a lot of stuff that we need to address. Um, but I also think it's sort of fundamentally unfair if we look at the, the current system and say that all this does is benefit people who already have 
stuff um, because the reality is that's not true and it's demonstrably not true. I think it's also important to, to, to relate to the, um, the concept of outcomes. When we talk about equity, there's a difference between uh, equity of liberty to pursue something and then equity of outcomes. So if you let individuals decide how they're going to live their lives and what particular interests they're going to pursue and how they're going to uh, spend their money, then inevitably you are not going to wind up with a final situation in which everyone has exactly equal resources. Um, the only way to ensure that people all have the same thing is to artificially uh, inhibit some people from doing things and then artificially shore up other people in doing things. So simply looking at the outcome does not tell you whether or not it was an equitable situation in terms of uh, power, opportunity, because the only way that would happen is if everyone pursued exactly the same thing, or you collectivized all uh, income and all property and then distributed it to everyone to make it equal. So in almost all of the successful movements uh, to overcome oppression and to overcome the, um, the restrictions that have been placed on people as a result of their membership of a particular group, uh, what has happened is that access to the equal liberty, to the uh, very specific kinds of things like voting or the ability to own and distribute property, um, the ability to um, acquire an education, almost all of those things have been a matter of letting people into the system. So it wasn't that the system in terms of its um, idealized uh, way of looking at things was bad, but rather that it was not being faithfully uh, executed. It was not being um, done right. So it's not that having a vote is a bad thing. What's bad is that everyone didn't have a vote. It's not that owning property is a bad thing. It's that only certain people were allowed to own property. And as various civil rights movements have succeeded, what they've largely done is break down those barriers to access those, those rights, those powers, those immunities that were given to other people. And I think it's also important that when you, when you look at a particular social situation and you see things in it that are unjust or you think that are, are bad, it's important to recognize that those kinds of bad outcomes can result from a number of different systems. We have plenty of examples all across the world where whether you lived in an absolutist monarchy or whether you lived in a, uh, a socialist form of government or whether you lived in a caste and collectivist form of government, there were always people who were going to be treated badly. So there are dynamics here that are going to supersede any particular economic system. And um, it's important not to simply attribute the, the bad outcomes that you see around you to um, a system, unless you could you know, really uh, produce evidence that other systems systematically produce better outcomes. Yes, Anne. I'd love for you to weigh in on that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and give you um, another question that's coming from the audience okay. um, to, kind of, to kind of pair with that. So um, can equity of liberty be truly equitable if people don't have equal access to healthcare, to childcare, to education, or to safety? So kind of following up on what Patrick was saying, if you wouldn't mind touching on that as well. Yep, so I was gonna go right, right, right into Perfect. that. Yeah, to <laughs> um, follow up on the end of what Patrick um, said. So I, Patrick, repeat that last sentence you just said. I don't know if you- Oh, my memory is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, basically it was something like, um, um, 
let's don't make the mistake of attributing the, the bad situations that we see around us to any particular economic system. The only way we could do that is if we had really good evidence that other economic or power distribution systems did not produce um, oppressed groups. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, um, I think I have to disagree with that um, because of um, it's it's always been. I can't look at this without looking at the structural racism part. Like I, I, it, I just I can't separate those things, and so it has never been equal, um, or it has never been equitable. Um, and not everyone has to have the same things like things, but everyone does need to have the access to and the opportunity to. And so I, it's hard for me to see um, these economic systems that are not, um, uh, they, they are inequitable and they have been um, from the foundation of this country. And so it's very hard for me to see it, um, to, to, to look at it uh, through your lens in that way, um, given what I know, um, for instance, in this COVID pandemic. So we could just bring it right on to where we are right now. So when particularly when we have, um, and getting to the, the person's question, um, you know, women in, the, in Mississippi make up 48% of the workforce, and yet we're 67% of the frontline workers. 30% of the workers in the frontline industries in Mississippi are black women and we are, you know, overrepresented in those service, in those, you know, in those frontline industries. So we're talking about the grocery store clerks, the childcare workers. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the bus drivers um, and we are overworked, underpaid, underprotected, you know, no paid leave, no sick leave, the wages aren't um, you know, where they're supposed to be. Mississippi has the largest wage gap in the country uh, where black women are making um, 56 cents on the dollar, um, white women making 73 cents on the dollar, um, Latino women are making, I believe, 54 cents on the dollar. And so, um, and, and then, the, and, and women are the co breadwinners, you know, of their families these days. And so, um, and we have the highest poverty rate. And so there is an inequitable system that exists um, in our economic system, right? And so, and, and the experiences are very real. Right now, you know, during COVID, who's dying the most? You know, it's black folks, you know, um, that's dying the most and, and brown folks in this country right, and in Mississippi, like who's being infected the most because we have, you know, these comorbidities. Well, the comorbidities are as a result of the structural racism in our healthcare system. And so I don't think that, um, so there is this gap that exists there um, when, you know, the person just said, what did they name the childcare? Um, what else did they talk about? Childcare and- Childcare. Child care healthcare, education, safety. Yeah, yeah. And, and even when you're talking about safety, safety with police brutality, but also safety in the workforce, particularly for low wage workers. Um, low wage workers are at a real vulnerability uh, when it comes to sexual harassment on the job because they are low wage workers um, and they don't have a lot of those protections, right? And so these are the experiences that I know of because I'm, I work directly, you know, with these women, know the experience, and I am these women, right? And my family are these women. And so, um, so the economic system is based on a structural system that is racism. To me, racism is about control and domination. And so um, that's also wrapped up in capitalism, right? And so that's how I see that. And so, um, so I have to disagree with you, Patrick, on that because um, it was never created for everyone to have the access. And so there is a sense of privilege that exists for certain people. I think Russ, when you were talking about the, the, like the big box stores, like when the small businesses, like when the pandemic happened, the big businesses stayed open and the small businesses had to close, then who was running those small businesses, you know, too? You're talking about people who make low wages, 
um, or don't have access to those capital. Um, and you're talking about, you know, black folks too. And so, um, so that's, that's kind of where I land, you know, um, with, with that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I wonder what it sounds like, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm not reflecting this right, but what it sounds like we're saying is that we don't necessarily want equity of outcomes, right? We recognize that different people are going to bring different skills to the same table. They're going to have different motivations. As a result of that, they may experience different levels of success, at least financial success. Um, and, and what I would say around the pursuit of happiness is that's not just financial success, that's finding fulfillment in your life. So it sounds like what we're saying is we're not driving towards equity of outcome, but that the outcomes have been dictated by inequity of opportunity. Um, and if that's the case, I think there's real room for common ground to look at it and say that there is no doubt that our system has created inequity of opportunity in a generational way across disadvantaged populations over time. I, I don't think anybody could look at history and come to a different conclusion. The question then becomes, well, how do we tear down those barriers to the, to the extent that they still exist? I, I think part of it is recognizing that there are barriers that still exist but I think part of it's also looking at, you know, we're having this conversation about individual rights versus common good. Again, I don't think they're separate from one another. I think they're, they're in line with one another. But really, the inequity of opportunity is a result of people in power limiting certain people's individual rights. And so if what we're talking about is, you know, sort of government versus individuals, which I think a lot of people would kind of frame it that way. The reality is every instance of oppression that we can point to, um, you know, start it with a government action, a majority asserting power against a certain set of people or denying a certain set of people rights. Um, and so my viewpoint is what we really should be talking about is how to make sure that we all have equal individual rights. Um, that seems like a productive place to start if we want to start tackling some of the big challenges in the country. I'm going to jump in for just a second. We're starting to get some good feedback from um, the audience members who are joining us on Facebook. Um, so I'm going to start to bring in some of their questions. I've got a long list left that we haven't gotten to yet. So those may come back up. But um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and, and, and get to some of these audience members questions. So um, kind of getting back to um, the direct conversation about COVID-19, what is more important in combating COVID-19? The individual's rights to reject wearing a mask and gathering in large groups or the public health of all people? Well, it depends on knowing what the outcomes of those two different situations are. The, the, the people who emphatically insist that there are natural rights that cannot be infringed upon in any situation, what those people would have to say was, it does not matter what the consequences are in terms of the spread of any illness um, when it comes to whether or not your right is being violated. The whole point of a natural right is that you invoke it when you don't want to pay attention to consequences. And that's quite deliberate. That's why I said earlier that a natural right is usually a trump card against the common good. Um, and at least in the way it's worded that way. Although historically, most people have thought that optimizing freedom is likely to produce the greatest common good overall. But so if you told me that, that COVID was going to mutate and we know almost certainly that half the population is going to die and someone said, yes, I know that that's the case, but I still have a right not to wear a mask, then uh, what I would say is uh, even as extreme as, as some people have argued and said that that was the way to look at it, um, belief in natural rights is not a suicide pact. There is always um, uh, constraints on almost anything that's even considered 
a right. Uh, we're all familiar with things like the right to free speech uh, does not include the right to slander someone or um, the right to life does not include uh, my right to insist that you give me your kidney if I have kidney disease. There's all kinds of limitations that we put on rights. And so typically what happens, and this is where we get into the psychology of how we actually make these decisions, typically what happens is that if an action is fairly minor and actually places me under uh, very minor restrictions, like I have to wear this over my face when I go in public. But the consequence for that is that fewer people die. Then that's precisely the kind of thing that typically, typically gets invoked to say that uh, your right to control you know, what, you're what you wear, just like what you say and what you do is, um, is justifiably limited by the good consequences that it will produce. Yeah. You know, we're not in that situation with COVID, but I just wanted to, to give an example about that. I agree with all that. I mean, I think what I would say is that if you go back to that articulation of individual rights as the right to think, speak, and act according to your conscience, so long as it doesn't interfere with the rights of another, you can easily arrive at the conclusion that uh, the exercise of individual rights still requires that a conscientious person should cover their, their faces based on medical evidence. Uh, you know, the, the analogy that I've used with some friends who have pushed back on that over time is, you know, I can't go into a crowded uh, audience and throw ricin on people uh, because that's effectively an assault. Well, if I know that the, you know, the, the particles that come out of my mouth and nose can have the same effect as ricin, then it's no different as a principle. It's, it, it goes back to that harm principle. And so I think philosophically, legally, there's arguments for, for why people should do things that don't hurt other people, even if you take an extreme sort of libertarian approach. But I, I think there's another thing that, that Patrick brought up that's super interesting as well, which is this idea of, of balancing risk. And so as an example, if you said there are two uh, or three pandemics going on right now, there's, there's the, the racial and social unrest, there's the coronavirus, and then there's an economic crisis that's going on as a result of our response to COVID-19 that some people would myopically look at COVID-19 and say, well, the only thing we should be focused on is the health and safety of people who might be subjected to COVID-19. I think a more sort of backing up and comprehensive view would be, well, what, what are the economic risks of a family that can't put food on the table or can't pay their mortgage? or can't keep their business open? And what are the health risks that are associated with those economic risks? I mean, there's been analysis that show that suicides go up in these sorts of instances. There's analysis that shows that opioid deaths go up in these sorts of instances. So there's, there's empirical evidence to suggest that there's a real health consequence to some of the economic questions that are unfolding because of COVID-19. And I think, you know, what, what people who are, you know, in a position of way these issues have to do is not look at myopically, not look myopically at just health, not look myopically at just the economy, uh, but be able to do risk calculations and risk balancing that takes into effect the likelihood of a certain outcome, the severity of that outcome weighed against the likelihood and severity of other outcomes uh, if you take a course of action that's restrictive. And so to me, that's the much more interesting thing than should we wear a mask or not? I think most people are willing to wear a mask because they think it mitigates risk. Cassandra, I want to um, bring you into the conversation and roll in a couple of different questions. Um, you know, thinking about kind of back to the theme of equity. Um, and, and like you said, we know that um, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting African-Americans and other people of color, especially in Mississippi. Um, and, and so thinking about kind of understanding risks and weighing the benefits of certain actions and also kind of economic necessities. I mean, based on the, the work that you're doing um, with, the, with women and, and their children, um, African-American women and their children in the state, I mean, what are the real life implications of this struggle between 
or this conversation between individual rights and the common good. So how do we see um, women, African-American women particularly in Mississippi um, and the children that they're trying to figure out if they go to school or they don't go to school or if they go to work or they don't go to work, how are these playing out during COVID-19 um, in Mississippi? Yeah, it's been definitely, um, it's been really tough um, to really see, um, you know, moms and women um, struggle just to uh, put food on the table, um, having to decide between their health, their job, their children's school, and um, and their job. Um, it's been it's been really tough, and just really seeing them, you know, put all the pieces together to even just try to make it work. Um, so, for instance, I work really closely with um, child care centers, and um, and I look at child care centers as community centers. And I love these women. I call them my superheroes. Um, and part of it has to do with my own story. But one of the things that we have seen played out, for instance, is um, moms have either um, had their hours cut um, as a result of, you know, these businesses not able to, you know, bring in, the demand isn't there. And so their businesses are, their hours are being cut. And so now mom um, don't have enough to, uh, enough, enough work. And so as a result of that, of her not having enough work, um, her, her income that she would bring in, there's not enough. And so um, food on the table has become a real issue. Um, children are back in school and she might not have had, you know, a Wi-Fi, right, um, or internet because kids were in school before. Um, and so um, also that impacts her transportation. Can she get the kid to school to get the work packet? Maybe she can't do that. And so now she's trying to also negotiate, well, I got to go look for work, but I am also a single mom. Um, who's going to watch the kid while I go look for work, or this is a mom who is having to be at work because the man is so great because she is a CNA um, or she is a, um, a, a cashier at a Walmart or, you know, one of those retail stores. And so now her child care is being impacted because these child care centers, some of them ended up having to close down. And so, um, or now these childcare centers are back in business now, and that mom has to negotiate what the fee looks like for that child who has to be at that center all day because mom has to go back to work. And so it's a lot of piecing together, really bringing in this family support, but there's a real struggle and there's a mental health um, component to this that has just been um, incredible from not only that mom, but also those children um, who are really just trying to um, just trying to get through. Um, and, and you see the inequities, you know, across, particularly, you know, in school, right? I have three kids and um, all three of them have disabilities. And I, but I have a support and it's still hard. Um, so I think about the mom who it has, has to go to work um, and she has to leave the child home with grandma if there's a grandma there. And the grandma doesn't know how to log that child in who has a disability to the speech therapist, to the OT, um, to the IEP meetings, to have those. It is a lot to finagle during these times. And then grandma doesn't know anything about the internet, right? And so, or she, there may not be internet. And so the child has to work the packets and the packets um, and, the, and the concepts from those um, educational packets are really tough and really hard. And so grandma may not know how to do um, the math concepts or the common core. And so we have found it to just be really incredibly um, hard on these families, um, just trying to you know, put food on the table and make ends meet. Um, it has just been really incredibly hard. And there's a lot of negotiation that has happened. The cash, um, the check cash places, they're getting an incredible amount of business, right? 
because now these moms are going in there having to, you know, bargain. Um, I need to get a loan. And we know what the percentage of the interest rate is, is really high. And so we're putting her further and further into debt, which means further and further into poverty. Um, we, we, you know, another thing that's been really interesting is talking with um, pregnant moms um, on these jobs who don't have pregnancy accommodations, which is something we advocate on behalf of. Um, going on these stores and they are standing on their feet all day long. And we know that that puts them at greater risk of having um, 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 miscarriages or it puts them at greater risk of going into childbirth sooner than, than later. And so we have just seen an incredible amount of, heard a lot from, from these women about how this COVID experience is, is impacting them. And it's bringing up a lot of frustration um, it, it shows a lot of inequity, you know, that exists here. And we are doing our best to just wrap around various services for them, whether that's child care, emergency child care with transportation, just to get them to interviews. One of the things that we heard was from um, young people who were on college campuses who were foster care kids. And college was their safe haven and was their home. And so when they got kicked off of campus, you got this population of foster care young people who didn't have anywhere to go. And so now we're talking about a safety issue here. And so, um, and, and businesses being shut down, these entrepreneurs and black women, we are entrepreneurs. Um, but when the demand isn't there, now we have to go and find something else to do. So it has just been, these are some of the experiences, some of these stories that we have heard and what we are doing to really lift up their stories and advocate for them. And then they're grieving in the midst of this because their loved ones have died because of COVID. And so we're holding all of that with them and they're holding all of that. And as a community, we're trying to figure out, I think as Russ said, like what do we do um, when it comes to our policies and our laws to really make things equitable you know, for them? I know that was a really long answer too, so, but I hope it answered it. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to kind of being time's up. So I kind of, there's there's one more question from the audience that I did want to, to bring in and kind of bring back to this whole idea, um, you know, about businesses being closed down and wearing masks and kind of the, the crux of this whole um, debate during COVID. Um, but, um, you know, kind of considering all the issues of business closures and sending people home and not being able to work, um, you know, do any of you have an opinion about whether or not a strict national or statewide two or three week um, lockdown, you know, back towards the beginning in April or May would have been more effective than what we're still continuing to deal with now, which is a drawn out, you know, continued cases, um, ups and downs in the number of, of new cases and, you know, still kind of struggling with this on a, on a wide scale every day. I think it, it, it would have. Um, I think we should have done that early on. And I say that because of who who's died um, and really taking it seriously that um, this was a real, um, this was a death threat. It's a death threat knocking at our door. And if we say that we care about all Mississippians, then that means that you have some kind of consciousness that certain people are not gonna fare well in this state. Um, and those are you know, black folks and people of color. They're not gonna fare well. And so the, the, um, all the health, the access to health um, care um, is, was gonna be really impacting. And so I think it really would have been the best thing to really shut down this, this, this state so that we can really get a handle on what is the situation. Um, I, and I know that that is difficult, particularly for those that need, need to work. And so, but I also understand that now we've lost so many loved ones as a result of that. And so in my opinion, yes, I think the state should have shut down. Um, if we say that we cared about all people and then worked to be really proactively about how do you take care of you know, those most vulnerable 
in the midst of this? How do you take care of those essential workers and uh, who really have to be on those front lines? Yeah, so so I would take a little bit different approach. I, I think I've heard people make this argument that you either needed to do a super hard kind of authoritarian shutdown or you need it to just let it run and develop herd immunity. I don't think either one is, is a good argument. Um, you know, China was able to do the kind of shutdown that they were able to do because they literally do control the means of production. They control supply chains. Um, now, for the vast majority of their people, what that means not in a pandemic is that they live far diminished lives uh, compared to Americans. But in the course of a pandemic, it allowed them to do a shutdown and still get supplies where they needed to get. Um, America didn't have the option of just doing a hard shutdown for everybody. Supply chains logistically would have been broken. People would have been without food. Uh, you would have ended up with chaos. So we're, we're not set up for that kind of authoritarian shutdown. I think what would have been smarter is, you know, pretty early on, we had a good sense of who was vulnerable. Right. If you look at who has been hospitalized and died as a result of COVID-19, it is overwhelmingly people 65 plus, and it's overwhelmingly people with comorbidities. And at least in the initial wave of deaths, um, you know, it was tied to a lot of nursing homes. And so I think we could have been much smarter in the way that we approached the problem. I think we could have protected vulnerable populations with quarantines. Um, versus trying to shut down the entire government, which just wasn't going to be feasible. So, I mean, my sense is that that we didn't do the right thing because we tried for some kind of hybrid approach, um, but we could have been more targeted than we were. I guess the only caveat to that is, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, um, And so I have a really hard time being super critical of any leader in this situation because they were faced with something that we hadn't been de dealt with for 100 years you know, split since the Spanish flu of 1918. Well, one thing I would say, though, um, is that I think the government's reaction, at least to the economic harm, uh, has been overwhelming. So if you look at how we compare to uh, the European Union, we've given out much more aid to our citizens than, than the European Union has. And really anywhere in, in the world, people talk about there just being a one-time $1,200 payment, but then they, they forget that we did 600 extra dollars a week in unemployment benefits, uh, which meant that two thirds of the people receiving unemployment benefits made more than they made when they were working. And a full one fifth of people receiving unemployment benefits doubled what they were getting paid when they were working. And so the government actually, from an economic standpoint, you know, spent three trillion additional dollars um, to try and, and mitigate some of the harm associated with the shutdowns that did occur but I agree that it, it's not enough. There, the, the government couldn't have spent enough money. Um, and this is one of the problems that I've got with the essential versus non-essential designation is, you know, tell your neighbor that he's non-essential when he's tried to feed his family. Um, you know, there, there's no such thing as a non-essential worker in this country. And so I think we could have been smarter, more targeted towards vulnerable populations. Um, but I guess that's uh, somewhat hindsight at this point. Russ, that brings up a good point that um, somebody else just commented on um, the comment section with. And so I kind of want to close out with this. It's, I think it's a good way to kind of end thinking about this conversation. Um, but thinking about, you know, those essential versus non-essential workers and a full shutdown versus just running straight through. But is there a way that, you know, you can, you can have compassion and concern for the common good while also, you know, having that same concern for the country's economic health. How do you balance those two um, and keep them, you know, in the forefront um, at the same time? So if, if, if that's directed at me, I, I don't separate the two. I'll, I'll help this. I'll direct it at everybody. I'll give everybody kind of a chance if, if they have anything to say about that to, to respond and then also just to have, you know, to share any closing thoughts you've got. Yeah, I, I would just say quickly because I know I've spoken a lot. I wouldn't separate the two. Um, I think economic well-being allows for well-being across the board. Um, and it's why it's so important to have conversations about breaking down barriers so everybody has an opportunity uh, for economic mobility. So in my mind, it's a balancing of risk and kind of what I said earlier, uh, 
um, but not something that you can say that there's economics and health. The two are integrated in a way that they cannot be unintertwined. That's not a word, but you get my point. Thank you, Pat. Repeat, repeat the question one more time. So the question that came in was, um, is there a way, you know, considering all of um, the struggle between essential and non-essential workers and a, and a full shutdown versus, you know, just, just staying the course, is there a way to balance um, the common good with economic health at the same time? I think it is, but to me, it has to be guided by a, by a certain set of values and principles about our people. And and also holding um, the history of this country um, that we don't want to go back to, or we or holding the history in the country that we were never um, equitable anyways. And so if we are guided by a certain set of principles and values, um, even when it comes to you know the unemployment and all of that, to me, that's something that should have just been there to be anyways. Uh, and didn't have to wait, we didn't have to wait until an economic crisis hit because we do have poverty wages. And we see that being played out with the racial wealth gap um, and the pay equity uh, gap too. And so it can happen, but only if we stand in the truth of this country's history and, being, and, and also guided by a certain set of principles um, and values that say that we all are important and we all matter. I think if the if the question is can we hold all of these things at the same time at the forefront if that's supposed to mean can we maximize every value that we have then the answer is no and the reason that the answer is no is because the laws of biology and physics and economics won't allow us to do uh, something that solves all the problems at once um, there is uh, there is, when we talk about, should we've had a, a complete shutdown? Well, the, the way viruses spread, it's very unlikely that even what we think of as a complete shutdown would have worked. It literally only takes one virus to escape and start up uh, a new um, uh, infection cycle. So it would be difficult to see how that could possibly work. But I will say, that what, what happens, what we actually pay attention to is the thing that tends to hurt us the most at the moment. And that doesn't mean that we're good at that. In fact, humans are notoriously bad at figuring out what they should actually be worried about the most. But the longer an economic crisis goes on, the more it will be seen that uh, COVID is less of a problem than the economic uh, trouble that is caused by our attempts to deal with it. And that's why you get people going sort of back and forth on these issues. Now, of course, you can take it into account and try to do a cost benefit analysis, but when it comes to something like a pandemic, a cost benefit analysis is absolutely something people that don't, they do not want to hear about. And the reason they do not want to hear about it is because the cost is how many lives will be lost and how many lives will be saved compared to how many jobs will be lost and how many jobs will be saved. Um, but we make these uh, calculations all the time, although we're often not really honest with ourselves that we do it. We know that something like 50,000 people a year die from car crashes, and yet no one seriously says we should outlaw car driving. And it's because we value the liberty that our car driving gives us. But we don't want to be so brutal as to say being allowed to drive is worth 50,000 lives. What we instead do is to come up with greater and greater kinds of safety mechanisms based on our experience in the past so that we can keep the liberty that we have but mitigate the harms that those liberties tend to work with. So hopefully, and I think this is, when you have a truly novel situation like this, not entirely novel because yes, we have had pandemics before, but it's um, certainly virologically uh, novel 
Um, the best you can hope for, I think, is that we pay attention to everything that we can so that we learn from this. And then our, the next time something like this happens, um, to the extent it's similar, we will have a better sense of the cost benefit analysis and what worked and what didn't work. Much of the valuable work that will be done to tell us what we should have done is going to happen in the analyses after the pandemic is over, which is hopefully a real state of the future. Um, I guess we'll see. But I think there is something that can be done in regardless of the analysis of the pandemic, because it was all, anytime there's a natural disaster, Hurricane Katrina, we see the inequities that exist. And so I think there's things that can be done that's absent of the pandemic that has, that continues to happen to um, people of color, black folks, um, low income working folks. And so I think there's some things that definitely can be done in the in-between as we're trying to figure out what the solution is. Well, I want to say thank you to the three of you for, for joining me tonight. Um, I really appreciate you being here and sharing your thoughts. We are all out of time, so we can let people go back to their Tuesday evenings. Um, but I will say um, thank you to the audience members who have joined us for the program. Um, we'll be sending out a um, an online survey tomorrow, so we'll put it in the event. So if you click that you were interested or planning on attending the Facebook event, then you'll have access to that survey link. So be on the lookout tomorrow. And if you're um, joining us tonight for the first time and don't like our Facebook page or follow us on social media, um, please feel free to like us and stay up to date on future events and programs and MHC news. Um, you can also sign up for our monthly e-newsletter by going to our website, mshumanities.org. Um, so we hope to stay in touch with y'all and let you know about future ideas on TAP programs. Um, we covered a lot tonight. There's so much that we didn't even get to. So I'm very appreciative um, for the three of y'all taking the time to kind of share your thoughts about everything. Um, so thanks to everybody again, and we will see you um, in the next month or two with another Ideas on TAP. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.